mention Jane Austen's name, and most people have an opinion about her life and work, regardless of whether or not they've read any of her novels. The common image is that of an English gentlewoman dressed in a high-waisted frock with puffy sleeves. Generally speaking, her characters are better known than she is, and the available facts suggest that she didn't do much, didn't live long, and only wrote six books. So what is it about her work that has stood the test of time? She certainly painted a picture of the nicer side of well-to-do life in the late 18th century, but so did many other novelists, poets, and painters of the time. Jane Austen had something special, which has kept her books on bestseller lists worldwide some 200 years after they were written. Her style is crisp, bright and witty, and her ability to capture the attention of the reader in the first few lines is never more evident than in the opening of Pride and Prejudice. It is as funny and inviting to today's reader as it was to Jane Austen herself when she wrote it. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. However little known the feelings or views of such a man may be on his entering a neighbourhood, this truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. In this film, we will travel to the places that Jane Austen visited. We will look at the places where she lived and using her books and letters, we will try to unravel the mystery that has become the Jane Austen phenomenon. Before we go any further though, Here's a whirlwind look at Jane Austen's life and an even speedier journey through her novels. Jane Austen was born on the 16th of December, 1775, in the rectory at Steventon, Hampshire. She was the seventh child of the Reverend George Austen and his wife Cassandra, following five brothers and one sister. It was a comfortable upbringing, with the family remaining at Steventon until the Reverend George Austen's retirement in 1801 when they moved to Bath. After George Austen's death, Jane moved with her mother and sister to Southampton. In 1809, Chawton Cottage was put at their disposal by Jane's brother Edward. Here they lived very happily until early in 1816 when Jane's health began to fail. The cause was Addison's disease and within the year she was virtually an invalid. In May 1817 she became gravely ill and was taken to Winchester for better medical care. Here she died aged just 41 on the 18th of July, 1817, and was buried in Winchester Cathedral. There are six novels, four of them published during Jane's lifetime, and two of them posthumously in 1818. Sense and Sensibility was the first to be published in 1811. It is the story of two sisters, Marianne, an incurable romantic, and Eleanor, known for her good sense and self-control. The plot is basically concerned with their efforts to find the suitable husbands, avoiding the unprincipled and weak young men for which the Regency period was famous. This was followed by perhaps Jane Austen's best-known work, Pride and Prejudice. Elizabeth, our heroine, is bright and intelligent and refuses to marry a suitable man whom she considers to be an idiot. She then refuses to marry our hero, Mr. Darcy, because his pride causes her offence. Then, against a background of some of the funniest characters in English literature, Elizabeth finds that she has been mistaken and that our handsome, rich Darcy is a good man underneath his proud exterior. She then falls in love with him and makes an advantageous marriage. Mansfield Park, published in 1814, is full of 
contrasting country house and bustling naval town imagery. Fanny Price, our heroine, is famous for her goodness, whether due to strength or fear, only outdone by George Eliot's Dorothea in Middlemarch. Our hero, Edmund Bertram, is rather pompous. In fact, Somerset Maugham, who was quite a fan of Mansfield Park, said of them, I recognise that its heroine is a little prig and its hero a pompous ass, but I don't care. Despite the course of true love running as unsmoothly as you would expect, the couple end up marrying and live happily ever after. The either loved or hated Emma followed in 1816. Emma, a rather spoilt, doted upon daughter, misuses her obvious intelligence to meddle in finding suitable marriages for all those around her with disastrous consequences. She learns the error of her ways and marries a sensible older man who will help her to use her intelligence in a more profitable way. The two books published after her death are a complete contrast to each other. Northanger Abbey was the first Jane Austen novel to be taken for publication. It tells the story of Catherine Morland, her obsession with Gothic novels, her exploits in Bath, and her eventual marriage to the sensible hero, Henry Tilney. Persuasion, by contrast, is her last completed novel. Her style is altogether more gentle, and our heroine, Anne Elliot, is an older, quieter type of girl who makes the mistake of turning down a very decent man, Captain Wentworth, on the advice of a friend. Through the course of the novel, she continues to love Wentworth. Eventually, he discovers this and renews his offer of marriage and all's well that ends well. So there you have it, a high-speed resume of the life and times of Jane Austen. Now we can slow the pace a little and take a careful look at the England Jane Austen lived in and wrote about, giving the opportunity to discover what it is about Jane Austen and her novels that has won such an affectionately held place in English literature. This is Steventon in Hampshire, where Jane Austen began her life just nine days before Christmas in 1775. It was a comfortable household, but no doubt rather a busy one, as Jane was the seventh child. There were five older brothers and one sister, with James being the eldest, born in 1765. He would eventually take over from his father as rector of Steventon. George was born in 1766, though there is little mention of him as he suffered from mental illness, which prevented him from living with the family. Edward was born in 1767, becoming the wealthiest member of the family, having been adopted by his father's cousin, Thomas Knight of Godmersham. In 1771, Henry was born. In his younger days, he was quite an entrepreneur, though unfortunately, he became bankrupt in 1816. He then entered the church, and was also rector of Steventon for a short while. Mrs. Austin must have been delighted that her fifth child was a daughter. Cassandra was born in 1773 and would be a lifelong companion to both her mother and to Jane. In 1774, Francis was born, the first of the seafaring Austins. His success was great with his promotion to the Admiral of the Fleet coming in 1863. Then, of course, we have Jane's birth in 1775, with Charles, the baby of the family, born in 1779. Charles was the other naval member of the family, rising to the rank of Rear Admiral in 1846. We can only imagine what a houseful the Austin family would have been as the rectory was demolished in 1828, though this sketch by Jane's niece Anna may help to give a general idea. When you bear in mind also that there would have been servants as well, not to mention the pupils who came to be educated by the Reverend George Austin, life must have been a little hectic. Was Jane's description of a noisy household in Mansfield Park based on memories of the Steventon Rectory? 
The doors were in constant banging. The stairs were never at rest. Nothing was done without a clatter. Nobody sat still and nobody could command attention when they spoke. One of the best known sources of material about Jane's life is a memoir by her nephew, James Austin Lee, which was published in 1870. As we look at present-day Steventon, his description of the rectory will help to bring back to life the home which proved to be such a strong influence on Jane and her writing. The house itself stood in a shallow valley surrounded by sloping meadows, well sprinkled with elm trees, at the end of a small village of cottages, each well provided with a garden. It was sufficiently commodious to hold pupils in addition to the growing family and was considered to be above average of parsonages, but the rooms were furnished with less elegance than would now be found in most ordinary dwellings. No cornice marked the juncture of wall and ceiling, while beams which supported the upper floors projected into the rooms below in all naked simplicity, covered only by a coat of paint or whitewash. On the south side, the ground rose gently and was occupied by one of those old-fashioned gardens in which vegetables and flowers are combined, flanked and protected on the east by one of the thatched mud walls common in that country and overshadowed by five elms. It must have been an idyllic place to grow up for two imaginative little girls like Jane and Cassandra who became inseparable from a very early age. Jane went to school in Oxford when she was only seven. This was possible because Cassandra was going and the determined little Jane did not want to be left behind. Mrs. Austin said of them, If Cassandra was going to have her head cut off, Jane would insist on sharing her fate. Both girls were brought home from school due to an epidemic of putrid fever, which was typhus. Jane was very ill, and the family feared for her life. Jane pulled through, but the aunt who had gone to bring them home had died of the fever. The girls then went to the Abbey School in Reading. It was kept by Mrs. Latournelle, whose love of the theatricals obviously influenced the Austins' treasured family pastime of performing plays. We often see this influence crop up in the novels, Mansfield Park in particular. Cassandra and Jane returned to Steventon in 1785 and continued their education with the Reverend George Austin and their brothers. This is a good point at which to break off from Jane Austen's own story to look at references to Steventon in her writing and also Jane's own images of childhood. Pride and Prejudice has some very realistic descriptions of a parsonage, a church and a grand house at Rosings Park, the home of Lady Catherine de Bourgh. In Jane Austen's day, all of these properties existed just as she describes them in Steventon. The parsonage is the home of Mr. Collins, who Elizabeth Bennet declines lost in refusing him. Here, leading the way through every walk and crosswalk and scarcely allowing them an interval to utter the praises he asked for, every view was pointed out with a minuteness which left beauty entirely behind. He could number the fields in every direction and could tell how many trees there were in the most distant clump. But of all the views which his garden or which the country or the kingdom could boast, none were to be compared with the prospect of rosings, afforded by an opening in the trees that bordered the park nearly opposite the front of his house. It was a handsome, modern building, well situated on rising ground. It is interesting to note the lack of information about the church, which would have been central to life at Rosings and the parsonage. This is perhaps because as the daughter and granddaughter of clergymen, the role of the church was taken for granted. As for childhood itself, Jane seems to have been the most comfortable and happy when she was with her beloved Cassandra. Others seem to have found her rather awkward. One cousin, Philadelphia Walter, said of her, not at all pretty and very prim, unlike a girl of 12. This was undoubtedly due to shyness. And when we consider the arrival of Fanny Price at Mansfield Park, Jane Austen describes the shyness and agonizing loneliness of a child 
which only someone who had experienced these feelings can do. The little visitor, meanwhile, was as unhappy as possible, afraid of everybody, ashamed of herself, and longing for the home she had left. She knew not how to look up and could scarcely speak to be heard or without crying. Some of her other views on childhood are based on her experiences of being an aunt rather than a child. She disapproved of unruly, spoilt children, but she still found humour in their bad behaviour. This description of Edward Knight's son George shows how... I shall think with tenderness and delight of his beautiful and smiling countenance and interesting manners, till a few years have turned him into an ungovernable, ungracious fellow. Is it George she has based the young Lucas child on in Pride and Prejudice? The argument between Mrs. Bennet and the young Lucas is very funny and has to have been written by someone with a first-hand knowledge of precocious children. If I were as rich as Mr. Darcy, cried a young Lucas who came with his sisters, I should not care how proud I was. I would keep a pack of foxhounds and drink a bottle of wine every day. Then you would drink a great deal more than you ought, said Mrs. Bennet, and if I were to see you at it, I should take away your bottle directly. The boy protested that she should not. She continued that she would, and the argument ended only with the visit. This argument could have been written yesterday. Its humour has lost nothing with the passage of time. To return now to Jane Austen's story. She had finished at school and returned to Steventon with her family. From the age of 11, Jane began to write. At the age of 16, she wrote a history of England from the reign of Henry IV to the death of Charles I by a partial, prejudiced and ignorant historian. Her sense of humour had certainly developed, as had her intelligence. It's been suggested that Jane began a novel called Lady Susan as early as 1794. Eleanor and Marianne, later to become Sense and Sensibility, was also drafted at this early stage as a novel of letters in the style of Samuel Richardson, one of Jane's favourite authors. In 1796 she wrote First Impressions, which would later become Pride and Prejudice. Her father obviously approved of her work and submitted first impressions to a London publishing house, but it was promptly turned down. In 1798, Jane completed Sense and Sensibility. She then drafted Northanger Abbey, although at this time titled Susan. When this was completed in 1803, it was sold for £10 to Crosby & Co, London. The publisher apparently locked the purchase in a drawer taking matters no further. When inquiries were made, the publisher offered to sell it back for the purchase price. This is why the first novel that Jane sold did not appear until after her death. It was at this point in her career that the first big change in her life occurred. The Reverend George Austen retired at the age of 70, James, his eldest son, took over as rector of Steventon, and the rest of the family moved to Bath in 1801. Jane was 25 years old. We know from Cassandra that when Jane was told of the planned move to Bath, she fainted. This is important, as this lack of ability to cope with stress may be relevant when we explore the onset of Addison's disease later in the story. From all accounts, Jane Austen was a very healthy, sensible young woman, not prone to fainting. Apparently, Jane soon recovered, and the family settled at 4 Sydney Place, Bath. Maybe it was the upheaval of the move and the subsequent death of George Austen that caused a halt in Jane's writing career for the time she lived in Bath. Or maybe it was the disappointment over the fate of Northanger Abbey. However, she did attempt a novel called The Watsons, but it was left unfinished. Northanger Abbey was written before she lived in Bath, so it would have been based upon visits made while living at Steventon. 
In her letters, she expressed her own opinions about Bath, and she obviously stored up information and experiences from her time there, which she treats us to in later novels. We can therefore put together a pretty accurate picture of Bath in Jane Austen's day. Bath was certainly one of the fashionable places to be in, in 1801. Although we know Jane loved to dance, something she would have had plenty of opportunity to do in Bath, she was somewhat sceptical about the place on her arrival. The first view of Bath in fine weather does not answer my expectations. I think I see more distinctly through rain. The sun has got behind everything, and the appearance of the place from the top of Kingsdown was all vapour shadow, smoke and confusion. In Northanger Abbey, Jane allows Catherine Morland to be more optimistic. They arrived at Bath. Catherine was all eager delight. Her eyes were here, there, everywhere as they approved its fine and striking environs and afterwards drove through those streets which conducted them to the hotel. She was come to be happy and she felt happy already. It doesn't take very long, though, for Catherine and her friend Isabella to see the shortcomings of Bath. Either this is the case, or Jane Austen is showing us the shortcomings in the young ladies. And when her wishes for fine weather were answered by seeing a beautiful morning, she hardly felt a doubt of it. For a fine Sunday in Bath empties every house of its inhabitants, and all the world appears on such an occasion to walk about and tell their acquaintance what a charming day it is. As soon as divine service was over, the Thorpes and Allens eagerly joined each other. After staying long enough in the pump room to discover that the crowd was insupportable and that there was not a genteel face to be seen, which everybody discovers every Sunday throughout the season, they hastened away to the Crescent to breathe the fresh air of better company. It is interesting at this point to compare the views of Bath shown in Northanger Abbey to those of Anne Elliot's in Persuasion. And Anne, though dreading the possible heats of September in all that white glare of Bath, and grieving to forego all the influence so sweet and so sad of the autumnal months in the country, did not think that, everything considered, she wished to remain. Perhaps Jane uses Anne to convey her own thoughts about Bath. Anne disliked Bath, and did not think it agreed with her. If we look to other sources for information about Bath during the period of time Jane would have lived there, we find that it was the fashionable place to be for the winter season, particularly for the country families who didn't have London accessible to them. There was no doubt a wide variety of society, but the dominant desire of all classes was to be elegant, and what's more, to be seen to be elegant, and cut a dash with as much style as possible. This pretentiousness is probably the key to Jane's difficulties with Bath. It would not have been a comfortable place for her to be creative, but she used her time well, observing the ridiculous nature of fashionable society, which she utilises to such advantage in later novels. This passage from Emma highlights this. Ah, that's a great pity. For I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, where the waters do agree, it is quite wonderful the relief they give. In my bath life, I have seen such instances of it, and it is so cheerful a place that it could not fail of being of use to Mr. Woodhouse's spirits, which I understand are sometimes much depressed. And as to its recommendations to you, I fancy I need not take much pains to dwell upon them. The advantages of Bath to the young are pretty generally understood. It would be a charming introduction for you, who have been so secluded in life. And I could immediately secure you some of the best society in the place. A line from me would bring you a host of acquaintance, and my particular friend Mrs. Partridge, the lady I have always resided with in Bath, would be most happy to show you any attentions, and would be the very person for you to go into public with. It was as much as Emma could bear without being impolite. The idea of her being indebted to Mrs. Elton for what was called an introduction of her going into public under the auspices of a friend of Mrs. Elton's, probably some vulgar dashing widow who, with the help of a boarder, just made a shift to live, 
the dignity of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield was sunk indeed. The Reverend George Austin died peacefully, but quite suddenly, at the age of 73 in 1805. He is buried in Walcott Church, where he had married Cassandra Lee some 40 years earlier. Jane, her mother, and Cassandra moved into lodgings at 25 Gay Street. It was not a particularly happy time for Jane. The death of her father would have caused great sadness, and when they moved from Bath to Southampton, Jane commented with what happy feelings of escape she finally left Bath. A great deal of information has been left to us in the letters exchanged between Jane and Cassandra. One constant source of curiosity for us are the letters which have been destroyed by Cassandra. Cassandra considered these letters too intimate for anyone else to see. One of the most interesting facts about Jane's time in Bath is the lack of letters written from four Sydney Place. It is not until January 1805 that a letter exists from Jane to her brother Frank, telling him of their father's death. Jane must have written letters. We can only assume they were of too intimate a nature, and that Cassandra destroyed them. After leaving Bath, the ladies returned to Hampshire, firstly to Southampton, where they lived until 1809. The house they lived in has been demolished. It was in Castle Square. Then came the most important move for Jane's literary career. Edward Knight, the brother who had been adopted by Thomas Knight, his father's wealthy cousin, put Chawton Cottage at their disposal. Edward owned Chawton Manor, with Chawton Cottage being a small house on the estate. At Chawton, Jane returned to her writing, revising Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice ready for publication and started work on Mansfield Park. So here is Chawton Cottage. This home was a happy place for Jane and because of this she revised and reworked her existing manuscripts and was inspired to begin the work on Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion. Bearing in mind her early death, we are fortunate that she returned to writing at this stage. The house is now a museum, so we are able to see exactly how Jane and her family would have lived. Many of the locations we have already considered, due to the passage of time, have left much to our imaginations. Chawton is the exception. Here time has stood still for us. It is interesting to consider the chain of events which brought Jane to Chawton. We know that the Austin ladies visited Edward and his family at Chawton Great House in the September of 1807. A year later, in 1808, Edward's wife died, leaving him with 11 children to look after. Although Edward lived at Godmersham in Kent and only visited his house at Chawton, it must have been of great comfort to him to have his mother and two sisters close by when he and the children were in residence at Chawton. Jane's letters show great concern for Edward's children, and she and Cassandra did all they could to ease their pain at the loss of their mother. Therefore, when Jane moved to Chawton on the 7th of July, 1809, she would have felt a great sense of purpose in her role as aunt to the children. Also, she had the advantage of brother James and family at Steventon, only a few miles away. If, as we suspect, the early effects of Addison's disease were already established, this calm, safe and secure atmosphere would have been perfect for the resumption of Jane's literary work. Jane was involved in the domestic running of the household, particularly in the absence of Cassandra. This probably explains her attention to household details in her novels. In one of her letters, she says, I am very grand indeed. I had the dignity of dropping out to my mother's laudanum last night. I carry about the keys of the wine and closet, and twice since I began this letter have had orders to give in the kitchen. Looking after Mrs. Austin must have been quite a task, as we know she was quite a character. She loved the garden, 
and must have been pleased with Chawton as there were improvements to be made. She is also thought to have been most concerned with her health, though some of her illnesses may well have been imagined as she lived to a very good age of 88. When Jane was very ill with Addison's disease, she would put three chairs together to lie on rather than use the sofa as her mother may have wished to lie down on the sofa when she came in from the garden. This would have been a very busy sitting room with many visitors calling. Jane wrote at this little mahogany table, stopping her work when visitors called or when domestic duties interrupted her. In one of her letters she says, Composition seems to me impossible with a head full of joints of mutton and doses of rhubarb. She also comments about visitors when she's had a good period of work on persuasion. We've been very little plagued with visitors this last week, but I'm in terror for today, a fine bright Sunday. Looking at this room now, and considering the nature of the interruption she would have experienced, maybe the scene in Pride and Prejudice, where Mr. Darcy is being constantly interrupted by Miss Bingley while he is trying to write, expresses some of Jane's own frustrations of needing to break off from her writing to enter into polite conversation. Mr. Darcy was writing, and Miss Bingley, seated near him, was watching the progress of his letter and repeatedly calling off his attention by messages to his sister. Elizabeth took up some needlework and was sufficiently amused in attending to what passed between Darcy and his companion. The perpetual commendations of the lady, either on his handwriting, or on the evenness of his lines, or on the length of his letter, with the perfect unconcern with which her praises were received, formed a curious dialogue and were exactly in unison with her opinion of each. How delighted Miss Darcy will be to receive such a letter. He made no answer. You write uncommonly fast. You are mistaken. I write rather slowly. It is interesting that the first work which Jane resumes is Sense and Sensibility, possibly because out of the three manuscripts available to her, it was the only one not to have disappointed her. Northanger Abbey would have cost £10 to buy back, and Pride and Prejudice had been rejected, although the manuscript was never read. Jane must have been delighted when T. Egerton of London published Sense and Sensibility in 1811. After the £10 fiasco of Northanger Abbey, the £150 she received seemed prodigious recompense. Both Jane and the publisher must have been cautious, as it was published anonymously. The calming influence of Chawton worked its magic. This combined with the boost of a novel published and the remuneration of £150 gave Jane Austen the confidence she needed and Pride and Prejudice was completed and published in 1813. The rest, as they say, is history. We've now considered Jane's three main places of residence, Steventon, Bath and Chawton. Before we continue with the remainder of Jane's life at Chawton, Perhaps this is a good time to consider the places that she visited from all of her three homes and how she recalled them in minute detail in her novels. One of the places that instantly comes to mind is Lyme Regis. Jane visited Lyme in 1804 while she was living in Bath, and it must have made a lasting impression. It is in persuasion that Jane writes so evocatively about this particular visit. They were come too late in the year for any amusement or variety which Lyme as a public place might offer. The rooms were shut up, the lodgers almost all gone, scarcely any family but of the residents left. And as there's nothing to admire in the buildings themselves, the remarkable situation of the town, the principal street almost hurrying into the water, the walk to the cob skirting around the pleasant little bay, which in the season is animated with bathing machines and company, the cob itself 
its old wonders and new improvements, with the very beautiful line of old cliffs stretching out to the east of the town, are what a stranger's eye will seek. And a very strange stranger it must be, who does not see the charms in the immediate environs of Lyme, to make him wish to know it better. The scenes in its neighbourhood, Charmouth, with its high grounds and extensive sweeps of country, and still more its sweet retired bay, backed by dark cliffs, where fragments of low rock among the sands make it the happiest spot for watching the flow of tide, for sitting in unwearied contemplation. The party from Uppercross, passing down by the now deserted and melancholy looking rooms, and still descending, soon found themselves on the seashore, and lingering only as all must linger and gaze on a first return to the sea, who ever deserved to look on it at all, proceeded towards the cob, equally their object in itself and on Captain Wentworth's account. For in a small house near the foot of an old pier of unknown date were the Harvilles settled. Captain Wentworth turned in to call on his friend. The others walked on and he was to join them on the cob. Jane loved the sea and is looking back fondly on her visit when she's writing this. Persuasion has a beautiful, autumnal quality to it and is the novel with the most descriptive passages about the English countryside. The Cobb is actually an ancient jetty that Louisa Musgrove falls from, causing a nearly fatal accident. Perhaps Jane's fondness for the sea has something to do with a mysterious romance. We know Jane was attractive even though we have only Cassandra's sketch of her, and as a drawing, it is perhaps not a great success. However, the eyes are very striking, and this description from James Austin Lee confirms that Jane's eyes were very beautiful. Her figure was rather tall and slender, her step light and firm, and her whole appearance expressive of health and animation. In complexion, she was a clear brunette with a rich colour. She had full, round cheeks, with mouth and nose small and well-formed, bright hazel eyes, and brown hair forming natural curls close to her face. Cassandra was the only other person to have Jane's confidence about this alleged romance, but as we know, she destroyed letters of an intimate nature, and as this account from James Austin Lee shows, she only gave this information long after Jane's death. There is one passage of romance in her history with which I am imperfectly acquainted, and which I am unable to assign name or date or place, though I have it on sufficient authority. Many years after her death, some circumstances induced Sister Cassandra to break through her habitual reticence and to speak of it. She said that while they were staying at some seaside place, they became acquainted with a gentleman whose charm of person, mind and manners was such that Cassandra thought him worthy to possess and likely to win her sister's love. When they parted, he expressed his intention of soon seeing them again, and Cassandra felt no doubt as to his motives. But they never again met. Within a short time, they heard of his sudden death. There's been much speculation about who this gentleman was, and in her book, Dear Jane, Constance Pilgrim explores the possibility that it may have been John Wordsworth the brother of the poet William. Did Jane exchange the name of Wordsworth for Wentworth in Persuasion? We know Jane liked to play names and places. For example, Charles Bingley of Netherfield in Pride and Prejudice must have been based on friend of the family, Charles Lloyd of Bingley Hall. The dates are certainly feasible, as Jane was in Lyme in 1804 and John, a sea captain, died when his ship, the Earl of Abergavenny, sank in 1805 off Portland Bill. We've always thought that Jane's interest in matters naval was due to her brothers Charles and Francis. 
Miss Pilgrim goes as far as to suggest that Jane had met John Wordsworth before this time. But that, as they say, is another story. It was on another visit, this time to Many Down Park near Steventon, while she was living in Bath, that she received a proposal of marriage from Harris Bigwither, a brother of close female friends of hers. He proposed in the evening, and Jane accepted him. But by the morning, she had changed her mind. He was eminently suitable, if six years her junior. Perhaps Jane Austen had listened to the advice from her own pen, which Jane Bennett gives to her younger sister Elizabeth in Pride and Prejudice. Oh, Lizzie, do anything rather than marry without affection. Are you quite sure that you feel what you ought to do? Jane Austen undoubtedly shared Jane Bennett's point of view. It was unusual in such a time when making an advantageous marriage was so important. For a lady of Jane Austen's class to be so set on marrying for love or not at all was rather brave. In this respect, she was well ahead of her time. Another place which Jane frequently visited was Edward's estate at Godmersham in Kent. In this quotation from one of Jane's letters, we can tell just how comfortable and relaxed she felt when she was there. I have no occasion to think of the price of bread and meat where I am now. Let me shake off vulgar cares and conform to the happy indifference of East Kent wealth. Emma was based around London. It is suspected that Highbury was based upon Leatherhead. Highbury, the large and populous village almost amounting to a town to which Hartfield, in spite of its separate lawn and shrubberies and name, did really belong, afforded her no equals. Highbury is only 16 miles from London, and the influence of the rural community by the metropolis is something we suspect Jane Austen disapproved of. Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day by hearing that he had gone off to London merely to have his hair cut. Another place Jane no doubt visited was Great Bookham in Surrey. This was typical of the visit she made as the vicar was her mother's cousin. Jane's circle of acquaintances tended to be limited to relations and friends of the family. Even when she had the success of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice behind her, she was little known outside her family. But by the time Emma was written, Jane's work was known to have been admired by the Prince Regent, who was said to have had a copy of her novels in all of his houses. Whether he read them or not is a matter for conjecture, but Jane dedicated Emma to him. It's interesting to note an earlier quotation from Jane and wonder what it was that changed her mind. When Princess Caroline wrote to the press complaining of her treatment, Jane makes this comment. I suppose all the world is sitting in judgment upon the Princess of Wales's letter. Poor woman. I shall support her as long as I can, because she is a woman, and because I hate her husband. But I can hardly forgive her for calling herself attached and affectionate to a man whom she must detest. This indicates that Jane Austen was well aware of the political climate, though in the main she chooses not to include such things in her novels. This was no doubt a conscious decision as she makes this comment to her niece Anna Austen about subject matters for her novels. Three or four families in a country village is the very thing to work on. The last chapter of Jane Austen's life is a very sad one. For this we need to return to Chawton, her beloved home and quiet, uneventful life, producing what should have been the early works of a great English novelist. Jane's untimely death deprived us of so much. It was in September 1815 that it became evident that something serious was wrong with Jane. Henry was obviously very concerned about her, 
describing her symptoms as causing a deep and incurable decay. By the May of 1816, Jane was suffering from back pain and even tried taking the waters in Cheltenham in the hope of finding a cure. Jane even writes of her own symptoms as, no doubt by this time, she was becoming really rather worried. I am more and more convinced that bile is at the bottom of all I have suffered, which makes it easy to know how to treat myself. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that Jane Austen had developed in some quarters a reputation for being cross and bad-tempered. And who can blame her? She must have been in considerable pain. Jane was described as being a poker of whom everyone was afraid. Also, this quotation is attributed to being a description of her. She has stiffened into the most perpendicular, precise, taciturn piece of single blessedness. Jane's irritability would perhaps have fluctuated depending on how much pain she was in at any given moment, but the stiffness caused by back pain obviously never left her. Although her health improved early in 1817, by mid-March she had deteriorated rapidly. Jane was feverish, she slept badly, and her skin had become black and white and every wrong colour. Jane's niece Caroline says this of her at this time. I was struck by the alteration in herself. She was very pale, her voice was weak and low, and there was about her a general appearance of debility and suffering. It is only in retrospect that we know she was suffering from Addison's disease. The first paper concerning this disease was not published until 1849, long after Jane's death in 1817. As we've mentioned already, indications are perhaps shown quite early in Jane's life that all was not well. The reaction of Jane to the news of the move from Steventon to Bath, for her to have fainted in the way that Cassandra reports that she did, was so very out of character. Jane Austen was just not the type of young woman to swoon into a faint over such news. Addison's disease causes sufferers great difficulty when under stress. This is because adrenaline, the fright, flight and fight hormone is not produced. This lack of ability in Jane could well have been as a result of poor adrenal function. Another interesting consideration is her preoccupation with Elizabeth Bennet being brown-skinned in Pride and Prejudice. Almost to the point of defending brown skin at a time when a milky white complexion was highly valued. One of the earliest indications of Addison's disease is the change in skin pigmentation, causing sufferers to appear tanned. In this passage, Miss Bingley is commenting on Elizabeth's looks. How very ill Eliza Bennet looks this morning, Mr. Darcy, she cried. I never in my life saw anyone so much altered as she is since the winter. She has grown so brown and coarse. Louisa and I were agreeing that we should not have known her. By this time, Darcy has fallen in love with Elizabeth and is beginning to hope that the feeling may be mutual. He jumps to Elizabeth's defence, describing her as one of the handsomest women of his acquaintance. Addison's disease is unusual, affecting a very small number of the population. The early symptoms include brown skin colouring, often with white patches on the body. This would perhaps explain why Jane describes her skin as being black on white and every wrong colour. Also, sufferers find it difficult to cope with stress. It is worth noting that Jane's final decline coincides with her brother Henry's bankruptcy. Sufferers tire very easily, are prone to nausea, vomiting, diarrhoea and severe stomach pain. Needless to say, Irritability and depression are also common. When the sufferer is lying down, their blood pressure will be normal. But when they stand up, it falls, causing dizziness and fainting. Perhaps when Jane wrote these symptoms for Diana Parker, 
a character in her unfinished novel, Sandition. She is describing how she herself felt. Diana Parker describes suffering from a more severe attack than usual of my old grievance, spasmodic bile, and hardly able to crawl from my bed to the sofa. One of the few publicly documented cases of Addison's disease in more recent years is that of John F. Kennedy. Like Jane, a great deal of time was spent trying to fathom out what was wrong with him. When we consider the reports of his skin's propensity to keep turning yellow, giving him a yellowish brown tan, as if he had been sunbathing, we are able to draw a parallel with Jane's description of her own strange skin color. However, it is the amount of pain that his friend's comments suggested he was experiencing that was alarming. He suffered with terrible abdominal pain and his back constantly caused him to be in agony. On a number of occasions, his doctors feared for his life. When Addison's disease was diagnosed and treatment given, the relief must have been immense. Jane was not as fortunate and Cassandra records the terrible pain Jane bore so bravely. In Jane's last few hours of consciousness, Cassandra asked her if there was anything she wanted. Jane's poignant answer was, I want nothing but death. All this considered, it is nothing short of a miracle that persuasion was finished and Sanditon ever begun. The gradual decline continued. Jane found it hard to walk, but she was still determined to take the air and visit friends and family. She used her mother's small donkey carriage, which is still here at Chalton. By the spring of 1817, Jane was in need of more specialist medical care. The two ladies moved to College Street, Winchester, to be close to Jane's physician, Mr. Lyford. Mr. Lyford did all he could, but he had no chance of helping her. Even if he had known about Addison's disease, he would not have had the hydrocortisone available, which treats the condition so successfully today. Jane Austen died in the arms of her beloved, faithful Cassandra, aged just 41, at half past four in the morning, on Friday, the 18th of July, 1817. This obituary appeared in the Courier on the 22nd of July. On the 18th inst at Winchester, Miss Jane Austen, youngest daughter of the late Reverend George Austen, rector of Steventon in Hampshire, and authoress of Emma, Mansfield Park, Pride and Prejudice, and Sense and Sensibility. She was buried at Winchester Cathedral in the North Isle on the 24th of July a large slab of black marble marking the place. So what of our phenomenon? Why does the author of six novels based in late 18th century England have versions of her work delighting television and cinema audiences in the late 20th century worldwide? If we could put this question to Jane herself, she would no doubt say that the answer was simple. Jane Austen wrote about subjects of interest to all, regardless of time and place. She wrote about communities and social behavior, the stuff of life. The major theme of her novels is love. There are many plots which twist and turn. For example, boy meets girl, girl meets boy. They fall in love, girl loses boy, boy finds girl, they still love each other, they marry and live happily ever after. It's no wonder the novels have a familiar ring to them. Gossip, love, romance, intrigue, even marital infidelity and all of these presented with the lightest of touch and the greatest of humour. Human nature is such that her work is irresistible. Jane Austen's novels will be read, watched, listened to, 
and enjoyed for centuries to come because she wrote well, her language is timeless and she told a good story that has something for everyone. Her work is uplifting for many reasons, the main one being that whatever the trials and tribulations of the characters, good always triumphs over evil, resulting in the inevitable happy ending. It is a pity that the most interesting story, that of Jane herself, did not have a happy ending. Her early death deprived her friends and family of her wit and companionship. The deprivation to the world of literature is greater still, as Jane Austen was undoubtedly at the beginning of her writing career and not as her untimely death forced her to be at the end. Jane should, however, be given the last word. These lines from Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice eloquently sum up Jane Austen's playful approach to everything she did. I hope I never ridicule what is wise or good. Follies and nonsense, whims and inconsistencies do divert me, I own, and I laugh at them whenever I can.